Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I begin my message, I'm just going to invite us to take a moment to prepare, uh, to prepare our hearts through prayer. Almighty God, you have placed a very heavy word in my spirit this morning. And so we pray, Almighty God, that it would go through each of us, that it would go deep into the transformative places within us, that we would not leave this place, Lord, with simply a good theology, but that we would be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And I am fully aware, God, that no, no eloquent words can accomplish such a task, but it is the presence of the living God. So we ask that your presence would honor us and that we would honor you with our response this morning. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And amen. Ever since we were little kids, we start competing with each other and setting goals for ourselves. I still remember it was probably about fourth or fifth grade back at field day, if you remember having those. And I used to be a fast runner. And my goal was to run that race and accomplish that, be the best runner there was. And they, we took off. There's probably 50 of us. And I came in second. And I remember thinking, I've got to get faster. I've got to set another goal to, to attain that next time we race. Now, as we get older, we set different purposes for our lives. We start looking at, well, what kind of career do I want to have for myself? What kind of money do I want to be making by this age and by this age and by this age? And what do I want my accomplishments to look like? What kind of spouse do I want to meet and marry if I want to marry? What kind of family do I want to raise? And with the kids that I'm given, how do I want to raise those kids? And we consistently reset goals for our life and add purpose to our life by reaching those goals. Now, one of the great challenges we have to overcome, not just as people in this world, but specifically as Christians, is that we must never confuse the secondary goals. Now, notice I didn't say they were unimportant goals. Career, finances, family, those are all extremely valuable. But friends, we cannot confuse it with our primary goal as sons and daughters of God, that our goal is to do two things. And Jesus makes it very clear for us. He says, first, you're to love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind and strength. Everything in life starts with that as its foundation. And if we are failing in that place, all the rest of life, no matter how good it may look on the outside, is truly a failure. Because it has no foundational support in the spiritual realm. And after we, we continue to learn how to love and, and honor God with all that we are, you know the verse we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. And the hard part about that is neighbors refers to those we like, but also to those that might just irritate us maybe a little bit by the way they act and their personality types not matching ours, but we're still called to love them. And so this morning, in just a moment, we're going to move to a very popular part of Scripture, Ezekiel 37, where we're going to talk about the dry bones being spoken into life. But before we do that, right before that, in Ezekiel 33, God speaks to the prophet, and he says that I'm setting watchmen out there. People who are there to warn all the other people about the armies that are coming to invade my people. And when I set a watchman at his post or her post, when I set them there, they are to call forth if the army is coming. 
And if the people listen to the watchmen, they can escape or be saved. But if they don't, then the accountability falls on them for not listening to the watchmen. But he says, what if you're a watchman and you go to your post and you see the army coming and you say, ah, they're still far off. It's no big deal. I'd rather do this or that. I'm not going to take the time to, to announce they're coming. And then the army comes and ravages the people. God says the watchman is then accountable for the destruction of the people. And you might say, how does that apply to us now? Because if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you claim the name Christian, that you want to be like him, be his son and daughter, we are called to be his watchman right now. And God is saying to us, even this morning, how are you doing? He's saying it for our benefit because God knows how we're doing, even more than we know. But he's saying, how are you doing? Are you being that one who sounds that call to a lost generation to come and know me, to know my forgiveness, to know my, my compassion and my joy and my patience with them, to restore them back to the one who created them? Or have we become so comfortable in a Christianized world around us where we just say, you know, I'm going to kind of just keep on keeping on and one day I'll get to stand before God in heaven. Well, understand we will. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ where he will evaluate the works and the way we lived our lives through the power of his spirit working through us. Now, you might say that's a pretty heavy way to start off the message. Well, one thing I've learned from studying the different social media outlets is you've got to start with a pop. And it's going to stay there the whole time. So just get comfortable. And if I say something that doesn't sound make sense, you can always come back and listen to it later. But we're going to move on to this wonderful passage in Ezekiel chapter 37. And we begin in this place where the prophet, we don't know if the prophet was just wandering through his field. We don't know if he was sitting at home. If he was in prayer, we don't know what posture he was taking. But in just a moment like that, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel says. His hand was upon me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord. This should encourage us. Because first it tells us that God is looking to interact with us. And if you're like me, where it seems too often that our prayer times and, and the times we worship seem kind of one-sided, well, this is a reminder of how to allow God to engage with us. And so he starts by saying, the hand of the Lord is upon me, and he brought me by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the valley. The first thing I want you to look at is that God is calling each of us to a time of separation. Now, as we look around the culture and what's going on, and we, we see flash pictures of New York City where there's like almost no one on the streets, it doesn't take much to realize that physically. But we can waste this time, friends. God is calling us to quiet our hearts and quiet our minds and to come away with him and to be separate from all the noise and the junk and the stuff in our lives and in the world. And he's saying, come alone with me. In fact, in the book of Revelation, we're given a very kind of aggressive picture of what this looks like, where God compares all the worldly systems, everything that's selfish and desires to uh, meet its own needs and its own pride, he calls Babylon. And he uses this term, and he says, with a mighty voice, the angel shouted, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a home of demons and a haunt of every evil spirit, a haunt for everything unclean and right after describing what the fleshly world around us looks like he gives out this call and this call my friend is to every single human being that draws breath right now and it says a voice from heaven came and said come out of her my people so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues for her sins are piled up to the heaven and God has remembered her crimes. Friends, it all starts with purposefully allowing a time of drawing back and being with God. It's something that he is calling us to do, but we initiate and say, God, I need to hear from you. Now, the passage goes on in Ezekiel where it says, I was carried out, my hand was on me and I was carried out by the Spirit of the Lord. He set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. 
He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And so all of a sudden, Ezekiel, in the spirit, sees this vast wasteland filled with not just bones, but dry bones. And they represent the absolute deadness that is all around us. These bones were not fresh. They'd been picked clean by the vultures. And all it was was an empty, dead place. But it was in this place, in this place where Ezekiel had been separated out. It was in this place as he listened to the Lord that he received a fresh word of God's revelation. And I know many of you out there are longing for that as I am. To receive a fresh word from God amidst all the challenges and noise going on around us. What is God speaking to us? And so first there's a time of separation. And then next there's a time of revelation. And revelation is so important, friends. Because so often, I know with my own kids, I'm sure this isn't true of yours. But with my own kids, they'll be so caught up on their devices that I'll come in and tell them to do something. And I'll walk out and I'll just pause. And I'll be like, I know that though they grunted at me, they did not hear what I said. And so I'll go back in and say, what did I say? And between the three of them, they can usually kind of formulate a general idea, possibly. Well, God is telling us to turn things off, to shut things down in our lives that are starting to, that have swarmed in and taken hold of our minds. To shut down the social media for a time, after this sermon, of course. But to shut down the social media for a time and to say, God, speak to me. And let me tell you why this is valuable. Because when God starts to release his revelation to us, you see people and things differently. You might hear a story about some older teenage kid who's, who was a bully and a thief and he was acting out. And you think, well, that's just bad parenting. Or you think, well, that kid's just like this. He's a jerk. Some kids are like that. But when you get alone with God, and you start hearing his voice and seeing people the way he sees them, you start to understand, you know what? I'll bet that boy has a troubled home. And God starts speaking to you and say, you know, he comes from a home where he's neglected and he's acting out because he's abused. And you start to get a heart for people. Understand that is what God craves for us. To have a heart to love people beyond what they look like and what they're doing on the outside. I won't take the time to do it, but you look through all the people that Jesus ministered to, people that were hated by the community, hated by society, looked down upon by the religious elite, and yet he saw something in them. And it's when we pull away in separation that we get to see a revelation, and we get to see people the way God wants us to see them. So the first step for Ezekiel and for us was separation, then revelation. Then the next one is a, is a hard one. It's a confrontation. You see, God speaks to Ezekiel and he says, Son of man, that's the term he used for Ezekiel. He said, can these bones live? And Ezekiel, in one of the most clever answers in the scriptures and wisest answers, he looks around and he sees the deadness of everything, but he knows the power of God. And because of that, he answers by saying, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. In other words, I see dead bones. I see a dry wasteland. For some of us, we may even see that inside us this morning. But he says, God, I know you can see things differently than I can see them. And so he says, you alone know. And it brings to a reminds us of a confrontation when God's word and God's thoughts and who he is collide with the selfishness within us. And the selfishness must be knocked away so that God can reach the true parts of our heart that he wants to transform. Let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus took Psalm Isaiah 61 one time and he applied it to himself in the New Testament. So understand, this is what he's saying about himself. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. This is what Jesus wants to do through us. To preach good news to those who are poor and poor in spirit. 
to set, to, to, he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. If that's you this morning, and because of all the stuff going on, or even long before that, you have felt beaten down and worn out. And quite frankly, depression is just a way of life. I know of no answer except for the fact that Jesus has said he has come to bind up your broken heart. And there is something he can do supernaturally beyond anything that you can think or imagine. He's come to proclaim freedom to the captives. There are some of us watching this morning and you are captive in certain areas of sin. And you've almost gotten to the point where you now just want to live that way because you figure there's no hope and no answer. Well, in the midst of that dark place, Jesus is calling out to you and he's saying, I am the one who can bring freedom to you from this mental and emotional and physical captivity. I can set you free. And it's a word for many of us this morning to be reminded that though we feel like, oh, I've tried Jesus before. No, it isn't about trying Jesus. It's about continually pulling back and yielding to him and letting him have victory in your life and being set free. Those mindsets, those things that were said about us for so much of our lives that were not true, or even if they weren't true, God wants to set us free from those things. And it says that he came to release us from darkness for those prisoners and to proclaim that this is the year of the Lord's favor. Friends, that is what God is proclaiming to us. That this is our time. This is our moment. Not because that all of a sudden there's some virus going around, but it is our time because we as believers in Christ can carry his anointing and his light into the world around us and to set people free. And so we go into this valley of dry bones and we face this confrontation. And so we were separation, then brought revelation, which brings a confrontation. Now next, it brings us to proclamation. Because right after this happened, it says, so I prophesied. God tells him to prophesy. Then he said, prophesy to the, the bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. It's the word of the Lord that sets us free, brothers and sisters. It's his word that delivers us from darkness. And it says, this is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and I will come to, and you will come to life. I will put breath in you. So Ezekiel says, I prophesied and as I was commanded. As I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. The bones came together, bone on bone. I looked, tendons and flesh appeared, and they came together. Something was happening. And as we pursue God in that place of pulling ourselves back, as we do that, God, will fulfill his promise and he will pull us out of that place of dryness. But he doesn't only want to do that for us. He wants us to be his voice to the generation around us to pull them out of their spiritual darkness also. So we do this through proclamation. But one of the challenges, my friends, is we do this through intercession. Intercession is one of the most challenging things. Intercessory prayer. It means to go to God on behalf of someone else. And when we do that, we are forced to be acting in faith. Because if we pray without believing God can change something, then we're praying in a way that doesn't accomplish anything. So, Russell, can I ask you, can you turn off that, that beeping in the back there? Or one of you guys in, in the back room, please. Thank you. Hopefully you folks can't hear it, but it's getting to me. So <laughs> Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God wants to help us hear and believe and pray and see into the spiritual realm. So we can see that he wants to set someone free. He wants to save that family member that we've been praying for. That is what he wants to do. And he wants to put faith within us, friends. That even though all the circumstances look like it's going to be a loss, he comes and he creates a winning pathway towards that victory. And so intercessory prayer is extremely invaluable. 
and it creates in us expectation. Let me tell you, take a moment, just kind of step back. Let me tell you about intercessory prayer, because a lot of us feel like we really don't know how to pray, or if we pray that it's not really effective. Let me just encourage you for a moment by a couple of people back in Christian history. First of all, there was a man named John Knox, great Scottish preacher. And Scotland was in this place of decadence, and he saw the churches in disarray and falling apart. And something inside him, as John Knox pulled himself back in separation, he heard a word from the Lord, and it created in him the prayer, Give me Scotland or I'll die. In other words, John Knox was so overwhelmed with God's heart that he would rather pass on than live anymore without seeing the presence of God transforming that country. And we read stories about how, how the different queens feared the prayers of John Knox more than anything else. Another story. I'll tell you about a man named, some of you may be familiar with, named D.L. Moody. He's a simple shoe salesman. Going about doing his business, but all of a sudden, a simple man, his Sunday school teacher, talked with him, got a hold of him, and his life was transformed. But even as his life was transformed and he became a preacher, and quite frankly, a very well-known preacher, he was still missing something. And these precious two older ladies came up to him one time, and they said to, to Mr. Moody, they said, we're still praying that you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and Mr. Moody saying, I've got these large crowds. People follow my ministry. Of, of, I think I've got that. Why don't you pray for the people? They said, no, we need to pray for you. And one day, Moody discovered what it was to not just preach, but to preach with the unction and fire of God. To the point where he went to, to England at one point. He was from Massachusetts. That's where he had done his ministry. But he went to England at one point amidst all the extremely well-learned people. And they were embarrassed to bring him in because of his gruff tone and the way he looked. And they thought, what do we need this fella in our, in our area of academia? But he came in and afterwards the testimony was, I don't know what he has, but I want it. Because friends, you need to know that God wants to fill you with his mighty anointing to make a difference in the people's lives around us. And we can't cowardly sit back and say, all of a sudden, I'm just going to kind of do my own thing and make it through life and, and I'll end up being with the Lord. We are called to be the watchmen over this generation. And we are called to intercede in prayer. And when God asks us to speak, whether it's from a pulpit or whether it's in a restaurant or on a Walmart, once we're allowed to go to those places again, once it's wherever, no matter where it is, we will then carry an anointing and the wisdom of God. And we'll find that we're far more effective in sounding the call to a lost generation. And so friends, just to remind us again, first, we must choose to separate. We must choose to pull back and let God speak to us and work in us. And then through that time, as we're patient and we listen, he will give us revelation because he wants to bless us with revelation to serve him. And that revelation will bring a confrontation and we will have to say, God, it's either your way or my way. And I'm choosing your way, God, not mine. And it will make us want to tell people about it and pray for people. But what's interesting is that after all the bones in the story of Ezekiel were formed and all the flesh had been put on it and they looked like an army, they were still missing one thing. It says there was no breath in them. How many of you remember the wonderful, wonderful book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? That white witch went around to the good people of Narnia and she did what with she with her wand? She turned them to stone. And do you remember how Aslan set them free? Once he had, he, as the Christ figure, once he was resurrected, he came and it says, <sighs> he breathed on the statues and they turned back in to people that had life. First, we start with the fact that God may very well need to breathe on your life again. 
And in that breath, we allow all of him and his will to blow out all of the selfishness and hardness that is formed around our heart. If there's any type of person that annoys you, any person with a certain political position that annoys you, you need to ask God to blow his breath to give you a soft heart for those people. Because can I tell you, you want to know how to make America great again. America was great in the 1600s when Jonathan Edwards was preaching the gospel in his church and people fell on the floor repentant and came to know Christ. America was great when the Wesleys came and their field preachers would go all out into the culture and into the fields and highways and byways and they would preach and hundreds upon hundreds would be touched by the power of God and their lives changed. America was great when Charles Finney and men like him went all across the northeast part of the United States bringing the gospel of Christ and person after person's life was transformed and revival poured out across the nation. Listen, I'm all for supporting a certain political candidate whose ideology lines up scripturally. But if we ever think that a man or woman in a political position is what will transform America, we have made an, an idol out of our political process. What will make America great is the presence and power of Jesus Christ. And it's not a politician that brings that. It's the church of Jesus Christ that brings that into this world. We are his watchmen, his vehicles to bring this into the world. Amen. And so, friends, as I begin to close, I always say that because I don't know how long really go, but as I begin to close, we see that after God breathed into these dead bodies, he says, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and breath entered them, and they came to life, and they stood up, and it was a vast army. Oh, the church of Jesus Christ can do. This vast army of men and women, young and old, black and white, all kinds of race, all types of people coming together and declaring Jesus Christ through their lives. What would it be like if his church would pull away for a time Get a word from the Lord and go forth praying and preaching and talking to people about their Messiah. That they care more about trying to convince them about Jesus than they were if it was their favorite sports team. Because I can tell you right now, if one of my favorite sports teams won the championship in that sport, it would be all over my social media. I'd like to think I'd have the integrity to be a good winner, but I can't promise that. But it would be all over my social media. I would be telling them about it. You can be assured I'd call my brother who likes the opposite teams and I'd make sure he knew that I was feeling good about it. If I'm willing to get excited about something so, quite frankly, that just passes away, how dare we not have a longing and a heart to reach into the lives of the hurting and broken and lost and captive and tell them about Jesus Christ? Well, they might reject us, okay? But as a watchman, you have then fulfilled your duty. Friends, we don't want to stand before God and know that we were meant to have such greater impact for him in this world than we allowed ourselves to have, either because of fear or laziness or cowardice. And so the final part of this, after we've separated, after we've received revelation and we face the confrontation and we give some proclamation and intercession, finally, desperation leads to transformation. It's a matter of simply saying, I want God's presence in my life more than I want to be entertained, more than I want anything else that, that this world has to offer. And not only that, but after I've worshipped him, I want everyone else to know him in that same way. So that we are loving God first and loving the world around us second. That is what a man or a woman of God is meant to be. No matter how much Christianity has been dumbed down by the culture around us, that is biblical Christianity. And so I say to you, my friends, this morning, are we a people who will follow scriptural standards and allow God to fill us once again with a heart and a trust for the world around us? You see, we don't just wrestle against people, the Bible tells us. It says, for though we live in this world, we don't wage war as this world does. For our weapons 
are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds and arguments. In other words, greater is the Jesus within you than the evil and demonic powers of the world. We are told that we have the ability to be victorious, but it is not you or I that can be victorious. It's the Christ in us, working through us to glorify his name and those around us. And so, friends, there are three, three types of responses to this message. One, you can simply just say, I'm being a fool, I'm being an idiot, a fanatic. That's old-time religion. That's not for us. I've been insulted by better people before. It won't hurt me at all. Our second response is you can agree with all the concepts I said. You can say, that's true. I believe that. But then within a day or two, walk away and not really let it affect your life at all. But I invite you during this season when even the culture is telling us we have to come away. I invite you to get alone with God. To call out to God. To let him reveal sinful actions and attitudes and repent before God. And let him fill you and breathe his breath of life afresh upon you. Choose to transform your schedule even now. To open up your, your book or, or open up your app and, and say, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to change my schedule so I am scheduling in more and more time to be with God. Because what God wants to do as we dedicate ourselves to him, consecrate means to set something apart as holy. God wants us to set our time apart as holy. He wants us to consecrate our money, to set it apart as holy, as a gift to him to be used as he wants. The way we, the time we sleep, the way we use our intellect, our intellect and our jobs, the words we speak, the life we live, it is meant to be consecrated, given as an offering, holy and special to the Lord our God. And I, I can guarantee you, friends, from the word of the Lord and throughout Christian history, that when we do that, the breath of God comes. He works in us and through us. And we can be people that don't simply just make it through this time on earth, but who leave a legacy of expanding the kingdom of heaven because we were here. May we be a people that the devil fears and God loves to brag upon like he did Job. What we're going to do right now is I don't want any words sung because I want us to focus for a moment. As Michelle plays for just a minute or so, let's take a moment and ask God, whether it's my time, my money, how I spend my time in my sleep, my intellect, my life, my words. What is it, God, that you need to breathe life on? Because it has gotten, my heart has gotten hard in those areas. People I need to, to apologize to and repent to. Let's just take this moment. It's not an altar call that we come forward. It's an altar call where wherever you're sitting right now, we go upward. Let's take a moment and invite the Spirit of God to break the heart of stone and begin to create a heart of flesh.
So God, as your Holy Spirit, out of your love, reveals to us, and we pray will continue to reveal to us these areas that have gotten kind of spiritually cloudy in our lives. We ask that you would first and foremost, Lord God, breathe breath on us again. Your reviving, renewing, refreshing breath of the Holy Spirit. And even now, Father, as we're in our rooms and our cars and wherever we're at, Father, may we just lovingly say, yes, Lord, and just receive. We're not looking for spiritual goosebumps. We're not looking for an emotional moment. We're simply looking for a cleansing power of your Spirit delivering us from areas of bondage and sin that we've allowed ourselves to drift into. That we would love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and Lord, all of our strength. And Father, we would ask that you would also, as you fill us and refresh us again, would you create something in us that does not come natural, and that's a heart to pray and intercede for those around us. To pray in faith, believing that you are guiding our prayers and you hear our prayers. And that you can do more than we can think or imagine through our prayers. Lord, give us a heart like John Knox. And may we scream, give us our families or we'll die, Lord. Lord, get hold of Jacksonville or we'll die. Get hold of Florida. Get hold of the country. Get hold of the world, Father. Or we can't live in it anymore. We need, we need need to see you move mightily, God. And so after you continue to help us to learn to love you more, birth in us a greater love for those around us, whether we agree with them or not, whether we like their personality or not, help us to have revelation to see people the way you see them, God. To have hope that they can be changed the way you have hoped to know that. So, Father, we thank you for meeting us this morning. And we realize that this is a process. So even as we, in a little bit, turn off this, this feed and we go on to other parts of our lives, God, may you scream in our ears, separate yourselves. Come away with me, my love. Separate yourself and help us to let you speak to the very core of who we are and change us, Lord. We dedicate these things to you, Lord, for you are our King and our God. Amen and amen. Now, thank you for joining me with that, folks. Uh, uh, if you're not part of a normal Anglican church, this is the part in the service where we actually share in the creed together. And the reason we do that is because we want to kind of shout out together the truth that we hold to as believers in Jesus Christ. So this isn't simply some kind of chant or mantra, but this is a declaration of who we are to the world around us. So would you join me in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was, was crucified, died, and was buried, then, then descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the, the resurrection, resurrection of the body, and, and the, the life, life everlasting. everlasting. Amen, amen and amen. I'm now going to pass it to our deacons.